Good morning. I welcome you to our services of worship this morning here at Coriopolis United Methodist Church. This community of faith gathered together in this sacred space, whether in person at times or whether through distance, we are one in the Lord. We come to this place as we have so many times before in our spirits, in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our prayers, in our minds, that we may receive, and having received, may go forth into the world. Even as we may find a sense of peace lacking in our wider community, we remember the Moments of creation that are recounted to us from the book of Genesis. That the Holy Spirit hovered over the chaotic waters, and out of chaos came order, and out of lifelessness came life. So in the midst of our chaotic life, and at times the chaotic life of our wider community, God can come and bring hope and renewal, faith, and joy. May these be yours in abundance as we live into more and more what it means to be the church for all times. I come to you with several announcements as they've been given to me. Uh, first, to note that we are still continuing with our um, our services as, as recorded uh, throughout the week and then, and then put together and not in person. This will continue uh, through January and we'll take a moment to consider um, the transmission rates, the, the hospitalizations as we cautiously and as we carefully uh, look after and care for one another uh, in our needs. Uh, during this time as well, uh, I've been asked to note that the grab-and-go meal that was planned for the end of January has also been put off. Uh, this, uh, Chris Drager did not want to have a, a kitchen with folks gathered from different households and, and uh, to safeguard. Um, and so we are looking for uh, toward February the 23rd. That would be our next uh, uh, grab-and-go community meal. Also, uh, the first of our uh, concerts of the new year, the 31st of January, George Mylosh will be uh, with us, tenor. Uh, be looking for that. Be, uh, uh, as, as, as we're looking towards Lent, we, we started all these uh, recitals uh, with so many, beginning with Lent last year, and I'm told that the, the Lenten recitals are, are already uh, set up already organized. Uh, we already have folks uh, put into place for that. We're excited for the way in which uh, these will be used uh, to bring joy and life and light to many people. With that, we begin our worship this morning.
Please join me in the call to worship. The call goes out both far and wide to all those persons who do abide. In the shade and shelter of faith, who gather in the sacred space. It comes to you, to me, to her, to him, a community of sight and sound and din, a hospital of healing for broken souls, a workshop of purpose fulfilling the goals. Of the one who came to make us whole and offer the world meaningful symbols, of wrongs made right and hurts made well, the greatest story that we should tell. We come to offer our prayer and praise to the one forever conquering the grave. All praise to our redeeming Lord. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we gather in your name, the church, the body of Christ, the community of faith that bears your name and which lives in your strength. Receive our worship even as you continue to form within us and among us a more perfect love. Amen.
My name is Kara Mason, and I'll be your lay reader today. The first reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Christ. The second reading comes from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. 
This morning, we're talking about community. I began to put together my thoughts of what I wanted to be speaking to you about. And I wish that you were all here, gathered in the pews that face me, but which now are empty. That sense of community is missing. We all miss it. I miss it. Um, I was uh, looking around here at the front as I was gathering my my materials for this morning, and I I found one of these. Um, For those of you who have been here in the pew, this is one of, you'll recognize our Connect cards. Uh, We would have uh, people fill these out if you were visiting with us. We would have people fill these out if you were a member and been here a long time. Uh, People would put prayer requests down, or, or people would note, I'd like to be more involved in this particular ministry group or, or uh, this particular uh, gathering. You know, I'd like to know more about Bible study or uh, baptism or a variety of things. And it was a way of community being able to, to, to make those connections with each other that now we feel we're lacking and we miss. Um, I I usually begin thinking about five, six, seven weeks before I arrive to a season, what it is that I want to be thinking about laying before us, studying. Um, And and the the idea of of community really um, rang a bell with me. And and so I planned several uh, weeks ago, as we were only just beginning the the Advent services, the thought about community between now and, and Ash Wednesday when we begin our, our Lenten cycle. Um, what is community? How does it work? How is it part of, of God's plan for us and for the church and for our world? There are many communities out there, many gatherings. Um, the choir who would meet here and practice is a community. Uh, The Mothers of Preschoolers group that meets uh, in in a church here or there is a community. The AA group that meets here is a community of people. Uh, You know, the folks that you'll find downstairs gathered helping with the Meals on Wheels program is a community. Um, we have community of people in our friends and neighbors. There, there's a group uh, that was involved here in, in a knitting group that formed its own community. All of these are ways that we have um, some special interest, uh, maybe a book club at the library uh, that pulls us together, that has us spending time with one another, that has us sharing ideas um, and, uh, and enables us to, to get something more out of life than, uh, than just simply being by ourselves. Um, you know, to be part of this community, the church, means also that it has some divine spark, some divine creation, some some God-gifted presence that calls us together, that unites us as one, that enables us at times to look beyond uh, great differences and helps us to see one another uh, as part of one group of people. So as I, as I think about community and as we think about the various ways that we think about community and what it is and what it isn't and how it helps us, uh, over the next six weeks, beginning today. Um, today I wanted to talk uh, about one aspect of that community, which is that, that community involves us as a group, but it also involves us as individuals. In different parts of the world, the tendency is more to one or the other. In churches that I would have have visited in Africa, uh, the tendency would have been more towards the group, would have been more towards being there with one another. 
here in America and in Western society, it's a little bit more the other way. We tend to think about individual accomplishment more. We tend to think about what is it that I want. And neither of those is wrong. Um, There is a balance that we find in our lives. The scripture passages for today were chosen with these ideas in mind, the the passage from, from 1 Peter, that like living stones, we are being built together in a holy temple to the Lord. You know, and there's that sense of we're one with each other, we are one in the Lord. You know, the kind of words that Paul had to share when he said that when this body that is of many parts is one whole, and that when one suffers, all suffer. But when one rejoices, then all rejoice. And there's that sense of, of unity that we find in that. And you skip over uh, to the Ephesians passage. The Holy Spirit has given gifts to the church. Uh, and, and in a way, this is abilities or talents, but it's also that the, the Holy Spirit has given the gift of individuals to a church apostles and prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body. These specific individuals are there to serve, and these specific individuals in their training, in their accomplishment, are the gift that God has given to the church. There's a balance to be struck. There, the, the individual leader uh, makes a great difference. That key uh, a person in the Old Testament, we see Moses, we see King David. In the New Testament, we see Mary, we see John the Baptist, we see the Apostle Paul. But also, on the other side of that balancing equation, the group moving in concert, pulling on the line together. Acts chapter 2, verse 21, that that all were together uh, sharing with each other as any had need. You know, the the kind of thing that Dorian and I would say uh, to young couples who are are coming uh, to get married, and we would talk about our own life, and we would say, well, we're, we're, we're rowing in the same direction. Because we know what happens if there's two people in a boat and one is rowing one way and one is rowing the other. You just keep going around and around and around. You know, we see this in the early church, in the Orthodox Church in the East, in the Roman Catholic Church in the West. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church was more hierarchical, was more, you know, one person who was a key leader, who, who had insights and, and who made statements and who led the congregation. And in the Eastern Orthodox churches, you see the council of, of bishops who come together to wrestle with issues together. And each of those ways of leadership has its own strengths and its own weaknesses and at times we need, we need each of those. You know, there are ways that I, as an individual, am, am gifted and called. And there are times to recognize that the calling of God isn't just to individuals, but to the entire community. These sort of love one another passages that we find um, in the Gospel of John. You know, in our world today, each of these two different compass points will have followers. The individual who takes a, a principled stand calling for unity that, that does not permit just mere uniformity, who will say um, what needs to be said uh, about an issue of justice, morality, faithfulness, that prophetic voice that stands up and says, how we've been living needs to change because Jesus, were he to show up among us, would not recognize this as being the way we should live. I can remember uh, um, during my college years coming back 
from Bible college and, and spending a year uh, at home and working with the Youth for Christ groups that were in our local area. And, and that means mentoring. That means working with young people. And at times that means telling them these words that you're saying and these ways that you're relating to your parents or to your friends or your girlfriend is not healthy, you know, and having to call them out and yet not wanting to risk the breaking of that relationship. Where's the balancing point of being able to stand up and individually to say, you know, on the other hand, when the individual lives with the group, saying that I'm part of this group, you all, or I guess as I'm supposed to say now that I'm living in Pittsburgh, I'm, all, I'm, I'm part of yins. I'm probably saying it wrong, using it wrong. But I'm making the effort to be part of the group. At times, a person will say, my choices, my decisions will have an impact on this group. Um, there is a, a professor of, of uh, uh, divinity, theology, named Stanley Harawas. Um, and he is, like many uh, professors in different um, seminaries, has, has worked from one place and, and then perhaps gone to another. Some of my professors from Washington, D.C. are now in Texas at Perkins or, or at Emory. You know. And so the idea that at times you will change positions. Well, um, Reverend Harawas was uh, serving in a particular uh, seminary and received a call to go to another seminary, and I believe it was a, a, a more prestigious appointment. Reverend Harawas was part of a local church that he had pivotal and important roles in, and he knew that leaving his appointment to go somewhere else would have a dramatic impact on his church. And he cared enough about being part of that group that he went to them and said, do I have your blessing to take this new assignment? And there was, I'm sure, prayer over that, and there was consideration. And in the end, I believe he took the assignment, and they said, this is good for you, and we're happy for you but there was the consideration of how that was going to impact his church. The whole versus the individual. I, I end with a, a little bit of Greek. Um, we were always told when we were learning Greek uh, that it was for us to study and we didn't necessarily need to throw our, our Greek upon our congregations every Sunday um, it would get tiresome after a while. But this is a particularly interesting word for today. Uh, the word l that I bring up is the, the Greek word luo. And it's a common word because it, it has regular endings. For those who have studied other languages and know that, that, um, that there are verbs and that they have different endings, whether uh, the, the tense or... or, or um, or whether it's plural or single, you know, singular. And luo is one of those regular verbs that we're able to use and, and study. But it has two meanings. The first of which is to, to loose or to free, as you would free a, a horse whose bridle is, is tied to something. You, you loose the bridle and, and the horse goes free. The other meaning of the word is to destroy. And our Greek professor, bringing this word up, said to us, how is it possible that one word could have those two different meanings, to free or to destroy? And if we go back to our passage of Scripture from First Peter about we're built together, living stones in a wall, our professor said it's like that brick 
that's part of that wall. And if you luo, if you loose, if you free that brick, it's no longer held in one place by the wall. But in the same way, if you find yourself removing too many bricks, eventually the wall will collapse. We're brought together to be part of the broader whole. We're called to be followers of Jesus Christ who calls us to himself and calls us to each other. And that is a togetherness in which we're not, we are, we are in unity without uniformity. We do not agree on everything, but we seek what is best for each other and we seek to live together in peace and harmony in a way that we become a light in darkness, that we become a sign of God's love and grace in the world. As we study over the next number of weeks the meaning of community, may we seek peace for one another, and may we seek God's love now and always. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, you have called us to be a living community, a people bound together as the body of Christ, a family united in love. Draw us closer to you. Draw us closer to one another. Forgive us that we fall so short of the ideal that we allow divisions to grow between us, petty disputes and differences of opinion separating us from one another. Forgive us when we become too concerned for ourselves, forgetful of the needs within our fellowship. Forgive us when we miss opportunities of supporting and strengthening one another, of sharing each other's joys and sorrows. Draw us closer to you. Draw us closer to one another. Help us so to grow together that when one of us suffers, we all suffer. When one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. Help us to show that we care for one another, that we are truly one body, that we depend upon each other, if we are to be the people that you would have us to be. So may we be a people of love and acceptance, a healing and renewing fellowship, a community in Christ. All these we ask in your name, even as we pray for the circumstances of our nation in this moment even as we pray for the divisions that have come between friends, among family, within churches. We pray, Lord, that we might have your spirit within us, strengthening us together, leading and guiding us in concert to move in ways that bring glory to your name and remind the world of your love, of your gift, of your calling to all of us to be the community that bears your name and elicits the desire among all for hope and for peace. All these things we ask in your name, and we pray the prayer your disciples were taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, O Lord, for your generosity of life, for the manner in which you send your Son into the world that we might know life full and abundant and eternal. We thank you in each day for the variety of gifts that we have received. And as we offer back to you, to the ministry of this church, to our wider community from those gifts, we ask that you would bless them, that they might touch many lives. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now to the one who comes to us with perfect love, who calls to us, beckoning for us to come and find hope and life, to the one who sends us forth to live in his strength. To Jesus Christ now be all glory forever and ever. Amen.